Well, good morning. I'm so glad that you came to the house of God today. I, I was thinking this week how I'm so thankful that everyone is welcome into the presence of God. Are you thankful for that? I'm thankful that everyone is welcome because this is where we experience life change and hope for tomorrow. This is where we encounter freedom and we express our love to Jesus. And so we can all come into the presence of God and expect him to change us. And I believe that God is on the move this morning. And so as I start this new series, um, I want to set it up for us. I'm going to talk uh, all through the month of June and it's called Family Farm. So I had a friend text me last night and said, can I wear my overalls? I said, yes, you can wear your overalls. I think she just wore a flannel. I see her over there. But that's also team spirit. You can wear your flannel. If you need one, you can borrow one from Quint, I'm certain. Um, but I want to unpack a biblical principle for you that is imperative for your life and your family. Now, I know it's summertime. I know that schedules vary. I know we on our refrigerator right now we have 10 invitations to all the exciting parties that will happen. Uh, but I want to encourage you, I want to implore you to make a commitment these next four weeks to get here every Sunday in June for this series called Family Farm. Because I'm believing that what God gave me to share with you is going to change something about your life. I believe that God's going to use this in a powerful way. And so get here every single Sunday in June. The potato salad will wait till you get there. <laughs> Actually, check that temperature first. But um, you want to make sure you can get to all the parties and still get to church. So make sure that you are, are here each week. You know, when God created the universe, um, he implemented natural laws, okay, things that would make um, the universe function or operate. And there are laws and principles that govern the behavior of the physical world in which we exist. And these laws and principles are nothing we can change, um, nothing that we can influence. We just have to, to, have to live with them. So, uh, like, for example, you might want to dust off your high school science memory right now, but... Newton's first law of motion. Anybody remember that? Newton's first law of motion. Okay, this is it. Uh, when an object is at rest, it stays at rest. When an object is in motion, it stays at the same velocity until uh, an, an, an external force is acted upon it. Okay, that's what happens every single time. That's the law of motion. Here's another one. The law of gravity. The law of gravity is the reason the sun and the planets and the moon, they all stay in orbit. There are laws of thermodynamics and conservation and the theories of relativity. And these all explain how the universe works day in and day out. We cannot wake up one day and just say, you know, I'm kind of tired of gravity. Sick of it. I'm not going to do that one today. Um, we can't decide. You know, I really just don't believe in the theory of relativity. <laughs> and because I don't believe it, it must not be true. And therefore, I don't have to live in that. Uh, we, we can't not like it. We, we can't just say it's unfair, so I, I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, somehow, we cannot live void of the laws of motion, okay? And here's the, here's the idea. The truth is the truth, right? Are you with me? The truth is the truth. Like, we have to live by it. We can't get frustrated at gravity and it changes. <laughs> okay, the truth is the truth. So here's the deal. Just like the Lord has instituted laws for the universe that we are bound to physically, God has also instituted laws that affect us spiritually. There are principles that are true, whether we believe them or not. There are principles that spiritual laws that we can't outrun, out-argue, outsmart, because they're, the truth is the truth. There are some spiritual laws that are the truth no matter how much we like them or don't like them or, or live by them or don't. And so the spiritual law that I want to talk about the next several weeks is found in Galatians 6, 7 through 9. So let's read this this morning. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit, will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. 
So I have no green thumbs. I don't, actually I don't have any green fingers, okay? There's nothing I have ever grown uh, successfully. However, I know a lot of incredible people in our church who are very skilled in these principles. And so I did some research on the past several weeks on the spiritual laws and the physical laws of farming. And today, throughout my sermon, you will hear from some actual farmers uh, so we can see both sides of what God is teaching us through this passage. So as uh, you, I share those videos with you here in just a minute, make sure you're looking for both the spiritual principles and the physical principles Uh, that God's trying to teach us here. So let's look today at four things we can learn about the spiritual law of the harvest. Here's the first one. You reap only if you sow. You reap only if you sow. So when I was talking to these local growers, they were explaining to me the seeds or the crops that they planted. They had a plan for when to plant, why they were planting it, when to harvest, and they knew uh, what they were going to do in order to receive this, this crop eventually. And so they reaped only if they sowed. So listen to part of my conversation with them. If you're going to have a successful garden, it won't be because you tended it well. It will be because you prepared the soil, you planned, you had the irrigation ready to go, you had your schedule built around it. All these things then the actual work. What we decide to grow fruit-wise is what grows here. This is a great fruit growing area. What we put in the garden depends on locale. There are some plants that grow better in Texas. We can't grow them here and vice versa. So it depends on climate. It depends on what we have grown in the past and learned through trial and error I start preparing a little bit before Memorial Day because the old adage is you plant on Memorial Day, you don't have to worry about frost. So if you plant early, then like I put in 54 tomato plants, I'd be out there with 54 bags trying to cover them so they don't get frost. I usually start like a month before because I'll rototill the garden a couple times. Then it takes me about a week to put the matting down and get it prepared for the plants and the seeds. Our garden is 40 by 40 feet. If potatoes grew in this quadrant this year, they move clockwise 90 degrees for next year, and the next year, 90 degrees more. So every four years, we cover the whole garden in potatoes. They draw a certain nutrient out, and if you just keep replanting in the same place, doing the same thing, you will eventually wear the soil out. So we rotate crops. Because of space, even with a 40 by 40 foot garden, we run out of room. So we grow pole beans. They grow up. You trellis them, keep them off the ground, and they'll grow six, seven, eight feet high if you want to reach up that high for them. And I can feed a family in two square feet off her beans. You were telling me about all the different varieties of tomatoes. How do you choose which ones, you know, to pick? Well, aromas are good for canning. Uh, Beef steak are good for eating. You know, so, and, and grape tomatoes are good for salads. So you got a variety. I always make sure that I plant enough to give out because that's God's blessing on me that I like to share. Okay, so it's easy to agree that it would be foolish to come to a field that you have planted a bunch of tomatoes in and be really disappointed that there's no watermelon. Why did that happen? I, I, I planted something or, or going to a tree and trying to pick apples off of it when it's not an apple tree. Only a foolish farmer would try to harvest something they have not planted. Now listen, it's almost too simple of a concept, but it's what we do in our spiritual lives. Planting is never accidental. It must be intentional. And so in your personal life, within your family, if you don't have a plan for what you're going to plant, the values, the beliefs, the habits, the fruit of the spirit, you are like a foolish farmer expecting your life to look and feel a certain way without planting the right things. A healthy marriage, a strong family, a fruitful and productive life never happens by accident. It happens because you have a strategic planting plan. 
You intentionally plant good things so you can reap a good harvest. Another simple but really powerful truth, and just track with me this morning, is this. What you plant is what grows. Okay, I know, I know you're laughing at me, but, but listen. If you plant generosity in your life for decades, you know what happens? Generous giving grows. If you plant faithfulness, faithfulness grows around you. If you plant respect and honor to authority, that's the crop that you receive. If you plant encouragement, a harvest of encouragement is coming. If you plant friendships and you listen to others and you care for them, a harvest of friends is growing up around you. If you plant a love for missions in the hearts of your children, you might grow a missionary. Listen, the seeds you plant in your life and your family right now is what will grow later. It's a spiritual principle that we cannot escape. The spiritual principle is true and it's true in both directions. Now let's think of it this way. What you don't plant won't grow. What you don't plant won't grow. I, I have seen this spiritual principle in my own life and I've seen it over and over in my years of, of ministry. Parents or families, they'll have kind of sporadic church attendance. Maybe other events will be priority so they miss church or, or in the most recent future, uh, watching online is an option so it becomes a little easier. We get out of habit. We stay home. Then a student gets into high school. Maybe they get into college and they don't have any interest in church anymore. And parents will come to me and they'll just be like, what happened? Like, I'm so frustrated. I can't get them to come. I can't get them out of bed. I can't get them to come. They're in college. I can't get them connected to a ministry or to a local church. My student is, is making some bad choices. I'm really worried about them. And I try to be tender, but I have to be truthful that there's this spiritual principle that the reason that student isn't faithful to church is because it wasn't planted in them. And in this case, what you don't plant doesn't grow. You can't expect things to grow in your life that you don't plant. In fact, this morning, I want to challenge you to examine your life. Where do you identify a lack? Where do you have a deficit in something? And instead of asking yourself, Oh, what's wrong? I'm so frustrated. Ask yourself this question. How good of a job have I done planting that thing? How good of a job have I done planting that thing? Because if you don't have supportive relationships in your life or you don't have contentment and joy or you don't have respect from your coworkers or your boss or your spouse, Galatians 6 says, God cannot be mocked. You reap what you sow. So don't be so quick to blame someone else for the lack in your situation. What you don't plant won't grow. Let's go to the second thing we can learn about the law of the harvest. First, you choose the harvest, and that will determine the seed. Okay, again, the spiritual principle. If what we plant grows, if what we don't plant doesn't grow, then something practical each of us can do is work the formula backwards. Now, this is a powerful exercise. It is worth your time and attention. Do it alone. Do it with your spouse. Do it with your children, maybe with your close friends. But look through the long lens. Start at the end result. When I was talking with John and Claudia and, and John, they were telling me, yeah, I want these kind of tomatoes. That's my long lens. I want to can these tomatoes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to plant in the ground the amount that I want to can. They looked at the end result. So instead of asking, what do we want to do right now? What do I want in my home right now? What do I want in my life right now? What do I want in my marriage right now? Ask these kinds of questions. How much do I want to be able to give generously over the next decade of my life? How many people do I want to tell about the love of Jesus? What kind of heart towards the Lord do I want in my 40s, in my 50s, in my 60s? When I reach my 20th anniversary, what things do I want to be present and valued in my marriage? 
What are some things we want to see in our children spiritually? What kind of person do we hope they're going to be? How many good friendships do I want when I have an empty nest? At the end of my life, what do I hope to look back and be proud of? And if you know what you want your life to look like or what you don't want your life to look like, you can plant intentionally to harvest toward those goals. Thirdly, it's important to remember this. Harvest is never immediate. No farmer plants corn on Monday and grills it for dinner on Tuesday. It's a spiritual principle. You literally can't do it. It's a process. It takes time. And many times you don't always reap in the same season that you sow. You don't always reap in the same season that you sow. I talked to my farmer friends about the timing of harvest. Watch this one minute video about that. Seeds, they tell you right on the package when to plant them, uh, how long you know, it takes for them to germinate. And it's usually anywhere from 55 to 60 days. So, so this is what we saw today. We'll be ready to eat in August? Yep, should be. Okay. Should be. There's a lot of science involved today, but it still comes down to a lot of faith because we put the seed in the ground and God does it, you know. Uh, with our fruit trees, we will have a tremendous crop one year. Last year we had great apples, lots of apples. This year we're going to have very few. And sometimes that's just, I think, the way God designed the plants. Give it a, a jubilee year <laughs> or a year of rest. So we're having few apples this year. Next year, we may have another bountiful crop. Yeah, you have to have the sun to warm the, the earth, to, you know, to heat the seed so it'll grow. And you have to have enough water to nourish. And not, not too much water, not too much fertilizer. It has to be just right. The most important is putting your trust in God and letting him do it. My wife, Cindy, was saying just the other day, man, I hope your garden doesn't get flooded out with all this rain we're having. I said, well, you know what? My father's been doing this for a long time. He knows what he's doing. In the Old Testament, a wise king named Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And in uh, chapter 3, verse 2, he wrote this. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. He identifies these seasons as separate or different. They're, they're often not simultaneous. And this is important to remember because we can't get discouraged or impatient with God. Have you ever said to yourself, I'm doing the right things, but things just don't seem to be working out. I raised my kids. I planted those seeds in my kids, and it is not coming out the way I thought. I planted this in my marriage, and it's not coming out how I thought. I made good relationships and good friendships, but I'm feeling like I'm in a very tough season right now. Galatians 6, 9 is speaking directly to that thought today, directly to that fear today. Hear it this morning. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if, read these last four words with me, we do not give up. Listen, when we have sown in the spirit, we need to have patience to wait for the harvest. A difficult marriage, a sexual addiction, a lifetime of bad habits sometimes cannot be reversed overnight. Sometimes the Lord does miraculous deliverance, absolutely. But you know what? Sometimes he makes us wait for the harvest. But you know what you can do? You can start sowing to the spirit now and eventually reap a harvest if you do not give up. If you don't start now, it will be that much longer before the harvest will be realized. Have you ever considered that it's possible you are sowing seeds right now for a harvest that you might never even see? I often think about that. When I was five years old, some of you in this room today sowed seeds of generosity to build this building we're standing in right now. Many people who sowed seeds of generosity for this building right now are not here anymore, they're in glory, to see it. But because 8150 Oliver Road was built and I was discipled here as a teenager in the youth group and I learned how to live for Jesus, the seeds that have been planted are things that no one, they may never see, but the Lord is using right now. 
They planted seeds of generosity, of faith, of prayer into the future. And God, and that's the reason why we're worshiping today. That's the reason why we sit in this room today. You can plant things right now into the soil of your life and your family that will affect your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and your great-great-grandchildren. You want to change the future? Start planting in the soil. Start planting in the soil. Because the harvest is not always seen in the immediate. But we believe what God's rule is true, that there will be a harvest. So we cannot give up doing good. You can plant things right now into the soil of this church that will reach people who are not even born yet. Harvest is not immediate, and you don't always reap in the same season that you sow, but God's law of the harvest never fails. So this word says, don't give up. Keep planting, keep planting, keep planting. All right, here's the last one. The last thing to remember about the law of the harvest is this. If you neglect the seed, you will lose the harvest. Now, between planting and harvesting, there's work to be done. Farming would be easy if you could just plant the seeds and then watch TV (laughs) until harvest time. I want you to just listen briefly one more time to some real-life advice about the threats that growers face. And I want you to listen closely for spiritual parallels to the natural act of farming. Because I believe the Holy Spirit is going to make some connections in this short clip today that is going to be meaningful. Threats the seeds, you got mold, uh, you got birds coming down. If they're not put in deep enough, they'll, they'll pick you clean. Uh, you have rabbits that come up. That's why we put like electric fences around. Uh, in my case, the dogs keep everything out of the yard, but I can't keep the dogs out. So I put my fence up to keep my dogs out because I have one that loves cucumbers. Another threat to our garden it is uh, the weeds that we have. And that all stems from our grandfather, Adam, who sinned, and that was one of the curses. But in today, with the science and everything, we have it a lot better than he did because we have matting now. It keeps the weeds out. We have the spray that kills the weeds and leaves the plants alone. So we've come a long way, but we still have to deal with them. Weeds are a constant. Uh, Sometimes we're successful growing fruits or vegetables. We are always successful growing weeds. We laid down four foot wide strips of landscape fabric and fastened them with metal staples. So 100% of our area is weed free, except for the holes where we cut to plant a tomato, a pepper, we'll get little weeds up and that's manageable. I planted spinach Uh, in a separate small side garden, six rows of spinach. And three or four days later, I had plants shooting up and I was so happy. And Claudia pointed out to me, those are weeds. And then there's the fruit. The fruit trees and the blueberries, they need pruned. And with the blueberries especially, they like to be pruned really, really hard. Old canes have to be cut out so that it can set set up new growth, and that's where you get your blueberries, on the new growth. And and with the uh, fruit trees, it's the same thing. You have to cut out old stuff. You have to keep them manageable. You are constantly, in the spring, pruning these things back. And that's when you get better, bigger, and more more fruit. You don't do that. like an apple tree will just go wild and you might get a little bit of fruit. Mm. And it can be painful to go through this growth. We have three peach trees right now marked for cutting down and they've served us well for many years, but they've kind of reached the end of their productive life. And uh, what we're gonna do is cut them down and replace them with new ones. I, I see that in my life. I have to cut down and throw away some of the things I've grown comfortable with to allow the growth that has yet to come. We have to plant the right things in our life and our family, and then we have to fight to keep the right things growing. And sometimes it's a battle. Satan fights against the harvest in your life. He does not want you fruitful. Jesus told us that. 
And John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And the enemy wants to destroy your harvest. He wants to tear down your marriage. He wants to rob your children of their potential. He wants to make your life unfruitful and ineffective. And it's a war to keep the right things growing and the wrong things away. I think one of the most important things when it comes to planting and harvesting, and, and both of the, uh, the Brydens and John Edney said this to me, we weren't able to put it on the camera today, is that if you are having problems with planting or harvesting, ask for help. Ask for help. In your marriage, in your family, when you're struggling with depression and anxiety, when you're discouraged, when you're offended, when something isn't working right, ask for help. Ask for help early and often at every stage of your life. You will need help. Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk more about what to plant, how to protect the seed, what threats to watch out for specifically. But let's end today uh, just focusing for a moment on verse 8, just for a moment. It says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. You know, inside this verse is the message of the gospel. That each person must choose to give up the field of the flesh, meaning give up living selfishly, making ourself our God. We must surrender our life to Christ and let him be in charge. And if we don't, living the way of the flesh will reap something. The scripture says it, it's so clear, it's bad. It will reap destruction. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. There's no other ending. If you live your life for yourself, if you live your life in the flesh, there is one harvest you will get, and it is destruction. Christ followers are those who sow into the kingdom of God, who build their lives God's way, who give their heart and their life to God as number one, and this way of living reaps eternal life. And so today, if you realize, just maybe even through the scripture or through the worship today, that you're sowing in the wrong field, or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to make that decision. It is the only decision that will reap eternal life. It's the only way. A relationship with Jesus Christ is the only way to get to heaven forever. So I want you to come to one of these prayer tables today. I'm going to close in just a minute, but before you leave the building, would you come to one of these prayer tables to my right and to my left? We want to pray with you. We want to just walk you through that, help you understand how you can sow to please the spirit and help you turn from sowing to please the flesh. Would you stand? I want to pray together today. If you're comfortable, would you put your hand over your heart? It's like you're, you're praying for it in the natural today. Just agree with me by saying amen and hallelujah and yes, Lord, as I pray today. Lord, we want to sow in the spirit. Lord, we want to sow in the spirit because we want to reap eternal life. And your word is clear that when we plant in the spirit, we harvest in the spirit. But when we plant in the flesh, we harvest in destruction. And so we repent of the way we have not followed you. We repent of the ways that we have followed our flesh. We repent of the things we have planted in our lives that are going to produce not a good fruit. And we repent of the things we have not planted in our lives that you have wanted for us. God, forgive us. And we pray that, that you would come into our lives as a divine surgeon to, to use your scalpel on our lives so we might be healed. God, like Claudia said in the natural, would you prune us? Oh, Lord, this is a dangerous prayer. But God, we stand before you because we believe your principles. That you are the gardener, that you are the perfect gardener, and you know the things in our life that need to be cut away. And so I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would make us trees that produce so much fruit. And we'll do what it takes to get there. God, we'll do what it takes to get there to be faithful and to be fruitful. Purge us from sin. Make us holy before you. We want to sow in the right field, and we want to reap in heaven with you forever. So, God, we pray we could honor the seeds that have been planted in this church, on this ground, in this congregation for hundreds of years before us, God. We want to, to plant in that field for the future. 
And so, God, for those sweet girls that stood on the stage in the very beginning, uh, to, to the kids that aren't even born yet, Father, we want to create a space where the Holy Spirit is honored. God, that people would know the gospel. Lord, that 8150 Oliver Road would be a light, not just to this city or this state, but to this whole world because of what we've planted in the ground. God, what you say is true. The truth is true. What you plant grows. And so, God, we're committed to that. And, Father, it's in your strong, true name I pray. Amen. Amen.